The book of James is quite unusual in terms of the New Testament books, not, not, term, not only in its message, but also in terms of just what it is. Um, the book of James is probably the best definition would be this, this little book, five chapters, is a concise how-to guide on how to be a Christian. That is, how to live as a Christian. Um, it's, it talks about the fruit that we should have in our life. In other words, what our life is supposed to reflect if we are a follower of Jesus Christ. It doesn't address the issue of salvation, and that's where some people get confused about it. We'll talk about that as we go along. But again, it's very practical advice for Christians everywhere on how we're supposed to live our lives once we are a follower of Jesus. Uh, it was written originally, and we'll talk about this to Jewish Christians especially, but it's true now that it affects all of us because the issue is, what is faith supposed to look like in our lives if we do have faith in Jesus Christ? And then some very practical things as well in terms of um, what it teaches us. Look at some of the basic uh, facts about it. First, the author. Uh, the author is, the book of James identifies its author as James. We believe that, um, well, there, there are four different Jameses in the New Testament. Two of them are apostles. There is James, the brother of John, the son of Zebedee. Remember, James and John were two of the apostles closest to Jesus. They were sons of Zebedee. Um, there is James, the son of Alphaeus, who is an apostle, which we really don't know very much about at all. It does, there's very little told about James, the son of Alphaeus. There's also uh, just a mention of a James who is the father of Judas, not Judas Iscariot. Um, and then there is James the Just, who is the brother of Jesus. Now, the writer of this book clearly is a person of authority because he doesn't need to he doesn't need to identify himself even other than just to say James. Okay, I'm James. And everybody knew who it was. In fact, the book of Jude, which comes later, Jude said, describes himself as being a slave of Jesus Christ, but a brother of James. So whoever the James was, he's well enough known that he's, everybody knew him, and he was kind of a point of reference. Well, James, the son of Alphaeus, was not significant enough to carry that kind of weight. James, the, the father of Judas, not scary, the other Judas, also, we don't know anything about it. he was not a person of significance, which means it had to be either James, the son of Zebedee, the brother of John, who's called James the Greater, term because you get people with the same name, they have to come up with some differentiation. Uh, but the problem there is that James the Greater was martyred. He was killed by Herod Agrippa in AD 44, very early. He was the first of the apostles to die. And pretty much everybody is in agreement that this book could not have been written before James the Greater, the son of Zebedee, was killed. And so that only leaves one James that is both significant enough a character and also would have been alive during the time of this writing, and that is James, the brother of Jesus. Now, James, the brother of Jesus, is known, is, is often called James the Just, because he had a reputation amongst both Jews and early Christians as being righteous and just, um, an excellent judge. Everybody really respected him. Um, we have references to him in the book of, in the writings of Josephus, for instance, the historian, in addition to the biblical references. He sometimes in the early writings of the church is called James Ad, um, Adelphotio, Adelphotios, which means um, James the brother of God, because he was the brother of Jesus. Um, we believe that James, the writer of the epistle of James, and Jude, the writer of the short, you know, one chapter book of Jude, both were two of Jesus' brothers, born of Mary and Joseph after Jesus. Jesus was the oldest. Now, of course, Catholics don't agree with that because Catholic, Catholics believe that Mary was Mary ever virgin. And she never consummated her, her marriage relationship with Joseph and never had children after that. Well, the fact that the scriptures in several places identify the name the brothers of Jesus and refer to the fact that he had sisters as well, the Catholic Church, sorry, I'm not trying to pick on the Catholic Church, but these things come up as we talk about them. Um, the Catholic Church has gone through great gyrations to try to come up with some other way to explain that. That they, well, well, they weren't brothers, they were cousins. Or, you know, there are theories that they were um, Joseph's children from a former marriage. Or that they were adopted. Or various other kinds of things in order to allow Mary still to be virgin and still, and yet there to be brothers to Jesus. We believe, meaning Protestants, that there was, there's no reason, there's no reference 
we believe, to Mary. There is no reference to Mary being ever virgin in Scripture. This is something that the Catholic Church came up with. And in fact, it says that Mary and Joseph did not consummate, you know, that Joseph did not know Mary until after the birth of Jesus, which would seem to indicate pretty clearly that after Jesus was born, they had a normal married relationship. Um, James the Just, the brother of Jesus, is referred to a number of times, not only in the book of Acts, but also in Paul's writing. Paul refers to James as one of the three pillars of the church, um, along with Peter and John. He identifies him as the brother of the Lord. Um, traditionally, James the Just was the first of the 70. You remember Jesus sent out the 12 to heal and teach, and then later he sent out the 70. Well, James the Just, the brother of Jesus, was not part of the 12 apostles, um, but he was one of the 70 disciples that became close followers. He was the Bishop of Jerusalem, and one of the early patristic writings identify him as the Bishop of Bishops, the head of all the churches. So you get the indication from the early writings, not scripture, but from early writings of the early church fathers, that he was almost like the first pope, except he was in Jerusalem, not Rome, and so he's not identified as the first pope amongst the amongst the um, you know the other church, the modern churches. Uh, but he apparently was respected not only as the head of the Jerusalem Council, but that all of the churches really looked to him as sort of the primary bishop amongst the early Christians. He, we know of his authority in the Jerusalem Council, that is the, the church in Jerusalem, the earliest church in Jerusalem, because in Acts 15, the council that meets in Jerusalem to decide the issue of how Gentiles are to be accepted, do they have to become Jews, do they have to be circumcised, a council met, Peter and Paul, uh, Barnabas is there, Silas is there, a bunch of these, um, a bunch of folks talking about whether or not Gentiles can be accepted as they are. Well, it is James, the just, the same writer as this of this book, that is the one who issues the final judgment, the final evaluation, and he, so he clearly is the moderator, the guy who's in charge of this council, um, and a very significant player. He continued to be the head of the church in Jerusalem and recognized as one of the primary, the pillars of the church, again, as Paul called him, one of the primary leaders of the church until his death. He was martyred by, after the death of Portius Festus, who was the Roman governor, there was a period of time in which there wasn't a Roman governor, and the, the high priest, the Jewish high priest in the Sanhedrin got very uppity during that time, and, and they, without the control of the Romans, you know, of a Roman authority there, one of the things they did was they started taking it out on their enemies. And so the high priest during that time had James, the just uh, stone had him killed. The story is apparently they had him first thrown off of a high place of the temple, and then because it didn't kill him, they stoned him to death. Um, something for which the high priest later got his comeuppance. We'll get into all that. But um, so we believe that this book was written sometime AD 45 to 49. Certainly, it was written before the, the Council of Jerusalem discussions. This issue of circumcising Gentiles. Um, it's not, it's not addressed here at all. And so we believe that this was before this became a real issue, probably earlier. I lean towards saying AD 45, quite early. Uh, because for one thing, the book of James is written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, which means the 12 tribes is almost certainly reference to Jewish Christians. 12 tribes being a uh, metaphor for the Jewish people, 12 tribes of Israel. And yet they are the 12 tribes who believe in Jesus. So they are the Jewish Christians. Remember, all the early Christians are Jews. Um, the, the fact that nowhere in this book does it refer to any issues related to Gentiles suggests it is very early in the life of the church before the Gentile question had become significant. So that's why I tend to think it's further away from the council in AD 50 before the Gentile question became a major one. If it was written in AD 45 or close to that, even within a few years of that, uh, that would make it almost certainly the first book written in the New Testament. Uh, the second book would be the book of Galatians, written around AD 49, immediately prior to the council in Jerusalem, because the issue that Paul is talking about in Galatians is the circumcision of Gentiles, and whether or not the Judaizing party is right in saying to the church in Antioch, and well, rather, excuse me, in Galatians, the churches in Galatia, whether they, as Gentiles, have to be circumcised. Well, Paul nowhere in Galatians, as we discussed last term, does he say, well, this has already been talked about by the Council in Jerusalem, it's already been decided, and no, you don't have to be circumcised. 
Well, because of the fact that Paul doesn't mention that, that means that Galatians was written before AD 50 as well. We believe it was written about AD 49, but if this was written, James was written 45 to 48, somewhere in there, then it was written even prior to Galatians. So that makes them number one, number two in terms of the books of the New Testament, James and then Galatians, and then 1 Thessalonians, okay? Um, again, recipients, the Jewish Christians scattered throughout the Near East, it is very Jewish in its orientation. Um, not only in terms of who it's addressed to, but the, the whole approach to it. The theme is true faith give, gives evidence through righteous living. In other words, um, faith without works is dead is an expression from, from James, or faith without good deeds is probably a better way for us to understand that, is dead. Um, it, the book of James is very much a sort of New Testament wisdom book. Remember, if, you, if you're in the wisdom class, we talked about wisdom literature as an Old Testament uh, form, which is, Proverbs is the, is the most obvious example, which is a, almost one-liners about you know, how to live a wise life, how to protect yourself from sexual immorality, from, from uh, greediness, from all sorts of things. And so there are these sayings, aphorisms kind of thing. Well, James is almost like that as well. A lot of people have identified that it is a New Testament wisdom kind of writing, very similar to Proverbs. It's full of moral exhortations. In fact, there are 54 specific commands given in these five chapters, where James says, be humble, hold your tongue, stop sinning, submit to God, you know, etc. Just very clear. And in that way, it's very much like a wisdom kind of writing. But the primary theme is that faith should have some evidence. If you have a true faith, there should be some example of it in your life. Now, that primary message is framed in an overall theme or context uh, of patience. Patience is a, is a word and a, an idea that comes up over and over and over again in these five chapters, that the Christian should be patient in persevering during trials and temptations, um, that should be patient in awaiting the second coming, and as you await the second coming, don't do all this stuff you've been doing. Uh, don't mouth off, don't hold your tongue, stop sinning, etc., etc. But always there is a sense in which there's a, a, a very clear do this and don't do that kind of approach, which is very much like the wisdom writings. In terms of what he addresses as other themes there, um, James particularly talks about, uh, he admonishes against formalism. Formalism means believing that just doing the ceremonial washings, the out outward kind of ceremonies, any of the outward kind of show of righteousness, that that was sufficient. That's formalism, practicing only a formal religion. James said, no, you know, if, you, if you're not showing positive works in your life, not just, not just doing the rules, then it's not real, that it is your faith is dead. He also was against fanaticism. Now, this was a time in which the church, very early on, the church was being torn by fanatics on both sides, fanatic Jews, and then in response to sort of fanatic uh, Jewish Christians. They claimed it was a result of religious zeal, but in fact it was tearing the church apart, and James is against fanaticism. He also is against fatalism, which says, fatalism says, I have no control over this. I just give up, it's all in God's hands. You know, like aksala, as God wills it, right? to use the Arabic expression. That's, that's a statement of fatalism. Whatever happens, then that's God's plan. Uh, the, the Christian Jews apparently were suffering from fatalism. He also addresses the issue of greediness and of uh, prejudice against the poor in favor of the rich, against the teaching and preaching of falsehoods, against boasting, of speaking evil of others, of oppression against others. All of those are the kinds of things that he raises as examples of do or don't do as appropriate reflections of what a true Christian faith is supposed to be all about. Um, now the purpose is this, the letter of James has often been accused, I'm going to talk about that specifically in a few minutes, has often been accused of contradicting or being contrary to Paul's emphasis on salvation by faith. You know, one of the, uh, the great re Reformation declarations, the solas as they're called, is sola fide, which means by faith alone. We are saved by faith alone. Well, some people have looked at, at James's statements about faith without works is dead and said, well, you also have to have works in order to be saved. And so the purpose comes up as to whether or not Paul is, um, Paul has made his statements, you know, Paul, before he wrote even Galatians, Paul had been teaching this stuff, 
Some people have proposed that James may have been written by James the Just as a balance, not as a contra contradiction or as a countering, but simply to bring balance, as though maybe Paul might have gone a little too far on the faith alone sort of thing, so that people, the libertarians, were beginning to say, well, I have faith, which means I can do anything I want. You know, three-day orgies twice a week. And James is saying, no, you can't. Some others have said this, since James' letter was written first, that maybe Paul's letter to the Galatians, some of it had to do with counterbalancing, not counter, not contradicting, but counterbalancing, offering a, a slight different weighing um, toward the, the faith issues. But the point is, these two do not contradict each other. I'm going to talk specifically about that in a minute. Are there people out there? Um, a real general outline, and we're going to look at a more specific outline uh, in a minute, is there is a test of faith in the first chapter, first 18 verses. Then James gives us the characteristics of the faith through most of the book, and then the triumph of the faith at the very end. Okay? Um, another way to look at the main points of James is that he talks about this is true religion, that it endures trials and temptations, it consists of doing good and not just hearing. It says, you know, James says, someone who hears the word and doesn't do it is like someone who looks at themselves in a mirror and when they walk away from the mirror, they forget what they look like. Um, there's a lot of very powerful kinds of, of uh, metaphors and images that James uses to make his points. Yeah, true religion displays wisdom, not just talking about it. Don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer, he says. That true religion befriends God through humility. We don't try to approach God with what we want and how we want to act. You know, I expect certain privileges if I'm going to be a Christian. Apparently a lot of Christians, Jewish, early Christians, were saying that. And James says, no. You know, you come to God in humility. He has saved you. You owe him everything. Don't, you know, it's not what you want. And then the true religion is blessed through patience, through prayer, and love. And again, this sort of is another outline. It walks us through the main points in James. Now, I should say, too, that uh, in terms of the canonicity of James, and canonicity, remember, means its acceptance as being God's word to us, not just human writing but its acceptance into the list of books that we believe are given by God. Now, um, the book of James had some difficulty being recognized as canon. Some of the earliest lists, early church fathers in the second, by the second century were identifying the book of James as being, you know, as being one of the books that the church was benefiting from. But some of the earliest formal lists, like the uh, Muratorian Fragment, which is a list of one of the first lists we have of the books that were accepted as canon, does not include the book of James. And so it sort of went back and forth. Some people advocating that it was a, a canonical book, some people saying not. Um, and there's several, it wasn't until the, the uh, fourth century that everything got nailed down finally, that is the 300s. 367 Athanasius of Alexandria issued a list of 27 New Testament books, the list we have today, as being the list of canonical books, and James is in there. Since that time, there's never been any of the major church bodies has questioned whether or not this is part of the canon. Well, why did it have a problem? Why, was it, uh, why were there questions about whether it should have been part of the canon? The biggest reason, probably, is that this book is written to the Jewish Christians. Which meant, as soon, because of Paul, by the end of the first century, most of the churches were predominantly Gentile. They weren't Jewish. You know, Paul is planting churches in the Gentile areas of Asia Minor, in Greece. Um, there are Gentile churches in the Syria, you know, Antioch, and other places. So very early on, the number of Gentile churches became significantly greater than the number of Jewish churches. Because this book is written specifically to Jewish Christians, it probably was not distributed very widely to Gentile churches. It's not talking to them, they thought. And so because it didn't receive wide distribution, it may have been slow in getting the recognition that it needed early on in order to be considered canon. It's also true that James the Just was not an apostle. And you'll remember that the, the writings of the New Testament, I, they either had to be written by an apostle or attested to directly by an apostle as being from them, like the Gospel of Mark. It's really the Gospel according to Peter, because Mark is recording Peter's sermons and thoughts and his recollections uh, from the time that Mark was Peter's assistant. Um, the Luke, you know, Luke was the assistant to, to Paul. Paul was an apostle. 
And so in every case, the New Testament writings were either by an apostle or attested to by an apostle. Despite James's status in the early church, he wasn't an assistant to an apostle. You know, he had a senior role in the early church, but was not himself an apostle. There was one place where Paul, it talks about Paul, um, you know, going to, uh, well, there's one place where it says, tell James and the other apostles. Some people have interpreted that as meaning that James was thought of as an apostle. Others have simply said James and the apostles as a separate category. We don't really know. But he was not a, an apostle per se. He was neither one of the original 12, nor the 13th that was elected to replace, um, to replace Judas Iscariot, nor was he Paul, who got in a special assignment and appointment as an apostle. So that may have been a problem. And there may have been some question early on as to whether or not um, James disagreed with Paul. And if he did, that created a problem. And there were people fairly early on who questioned, well, now, wait a minute. Is James theologically correct here, or is he wrong? <coughs> Let's talk about that issue. Let's talk about faith versus works. Um, Paul versus James. Because a lot of people have thought that James and Paul disagree with each other. Yes, Bob? Assuming that this James is the half-brother of Jesus, you would think that, you would sort of expect that both Jesus and James being carpenter's sons would be sort of blue-collar, uneducated, semi-uneducated guys. And yet, exactly the opposite is the truth. It's true because they both come, come out as very educated, sounding, uh, leader type people. Right. Well, the reason for that is because they were Jews. It's true that the majority of people in that day were illiterate, especially women, but uh, most men would have been illiterate too, except for Jews. Every Jewish male was taught to read. By the time they were 13, they had to be able to stand up and read from the Jewish scripture in public as part of their, part of their bar mitzvah. That's how they, that was the rite of passage into adulthood. Which means that whereas most Gentiles in that day, unless they were well-to-do, unless they were wealthy, um, or you know, citizens, otherwise people of privilege, literacy was considered a luxury. And yet, to the Jews, every Jewish male had to learn to read. And they had to study scripture because of the nature of the world at that time, in addition to learning Hebrew, they would have spoken Aramaic, which was the street language that they had picked up when the Jews were in captivity to the, to the Babylonians, because Aramaic is related to Chaldean, the language of the Babylonians. And because it was the language of the world at that point, they all would have learned Greek. I mean, it's just like, how many Mexicans do you know that speak English now in, in, the, in the area where English is a, a dominant force? It would have been many times more likely that somebody spoke Greek back then than someone would speak English. So. That's the reason why you get these people who were carpenters or fishermen and they seem like simple folk. Well, how could they write these letters? How could they? Well, because they were, they were still well educated as Jewish men. Um, and that's one of the reasons that the Jews got special privilege, like from the Romans. You know, the Romans required everybody else in, the, in their whole Roman Empire to worship the emperors. And if they didn't worship the pantheon of Roman gods, then there were serious questions as to whether or not they might be subversive. They let the Jews get away with this because the Jews proved to be too valuable. They were so well educated as a people. They were, you know, they were smart. They were financially, you know, very savvy. Um, the Jews were head and shoulders above everybody else in terms of sophistication and education in those days. So much so that the, the Romans gave them the only pass from not worshiping the emperors, etc. And in fact, Christians benefited from that as long as Christianity was seen as part of Judaism. It's when Christianity was clearly divided from Judaism that the Christians started being persecuted by the Romans. Because as long as they were thought of as Jews, the Romans left them alone because the Jews were quite exceptional. And one of the ways that they were was because of their education. Now, it is true that um, the book of James is, is fairly eloquent in its Greek. It's not as eloquent as like Hebrews. It's considerably more eloquent than John. You know, the, the writings of John. John's writings are quite simple. They're not, it's, they're, they're not dumb, but they're not very uh, erudite. You know, his, his phrases are short, his language is simple, his vocabulary is not that grand. 
Hebrews is the most eloquent of the Greek writings in the New Testament. But um, the book of James is somewhere in between. Now, whether that's because over the years James you know, took classes at the local instituto and you know learned more, got more sophisticated, for whatever reason, we don't know exactly. Some, some again, more liberal scholars have proposed that the eloquence and the level, not the high, it's not the highest level of Greek we have in the New Testament, but the eloquence or, or polish of the Greek that James uses. Some people said it's unlikely he could have been a Jewish carpenter and you know and it, it, been that good. And others said, well, a lot of Jews in that day exceeded what would, you would have thought of because of just the nature of their upbringing. I mean, they, were they were educated, all of them given basic education, and many of them went on to do their own study and, and to learn more. And James, uh, he was a man of some significance, leading the, not just the Jerusalem Council, but in a likelihood perceived by many people as being the head of the, of the whole of the Christian church early on. Um, and he may very well have taken that so seriously that he studied enough to develop his, his, his not only his theology, but his Greek. We don't know for sure. But it is, it is different than thinking about non-Jewish you know, writers that might come along. Yes? I think you don't realize how much uh, emphasis they put on education. I just got to read a book by a young man who grew up in Hungary, a Jewish young man during the 30s, and he was a teenager in the 40s, and he would get up and have to be at rabbi school at like six or seven in the morning. Would then take would go to regular school until early afternoon, go back to school until around nine or ten at night, and that was his schedule. Yeah. Well, it's it's also true, and that's not the case during the time of James, but after the destruction of the temple um, and the Babylonian exile, when the Jews struggled to, to figure out how do we still be Jews? You know, how do we continue to be one people, God's people, apart from everything that we thought made us God's people? The promised land is gone. The temple is destroyed. What are we going to do? Well, that's when they had synagogues before as sort of prayer houses. But the whole concept of the synagogue developed as a place of learning, as a community center, and a place of prayer and study. And so the whole study idea really got extra magnified because the idea is we've lost the temple, we've lost the promised land, we're not going to stop being God's people, and the way to make sure that we hang on to that is to make sure we study God's word. And so the discipline of the Jewish people, especially after the destruction of the temple, I mean, it was a lot before. I mean, again, all Jewish males had to learn to read, and to study, and to know God's word. But later, it became really intensified because that was how they saw themselves hanging on to what it meant to be Jew. A great, a great lot of that was because uh, was through study, study through the synagogues, and the rabbi schools would have been at the synagogues and things like that. Okay, the shuls. Okay, so this whole issue of faith versus works. Luther, Martin Luther, uh, was one of the people who really had a problem with James. In fact, Luther called um, the book of James a ripe straw epistle, or an epistle of straw, meaning not substance. In fact. He had it listed as, as a, um, a questionable book, whether it should be canon. Technically, I think it's still listed as uh, antilegomena, which means sort of gray area by Lutherans. <laughs> now, Luther took it and put it at the back of his Bible, supposedly so that he didn't have to flip through it when he was looking for something else. But, um, he, and he did that because he thought that, that James contradicted or disagreed with Paul's uh, doctrine of justification by faith alone. Um, and that, after all, was the issue, as much as any other single issue, that was what uh, Luther was all about. That was the thing he was struggling against the Catholic Church about. That you're not saved by works, you're not saved by being obedient to a church, the church, or the Pope. You are saved by faith alone, sola fide, as we find it in Scripture, sola scriptura. And so because that was... You know, that was what was life and death to Martin Luther. When he read James, and James seemed to be saying there's something else, it's not sola fide, it's fide plus works, then he had a problem with that. Now, it's, it, we have to be fair and say that that was only true early on in Luther's <coughs> interpretation. Later on, he eased up about um, his feeling about James. In fact, later on, he said, 
you are saved by faith alone, but if faith is alone, it is not faith. So, which is exactly what, what James is saying. And later on, um, Luther actually complimented the book of James as being a book that emphasizes entirely God's directions rather than men's directions. So he got a little bit better with it. But early on, Luther was one of those people that felt like James was contradicting Paul. As I said, some people have thought that James might have been a sort of a, a, a balance, written as a balance to Paul, or that Paul's Galatians might be written as a balance to James, because those two things do need to be held in balance. Um, interestingly, the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Churches both look to James as disproving the Reformation's insistence on sola fide, faith alone. Because the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Churches both say that you have to have good works in order to be saved. That you can have all the faith in the world if you don't have sufficient good works, you're not saved. Well, we Protestants don't agree with that. Nor do I think that James gives us justification for saying that you, you have to have good works. For that matter, if you look at Paul, Paul frequently and consistently said, you have to live a holy life. If you're not living a holy life, then you're not being what God wants you to be. Even though Paul is the one who said faith without, you know, that you, um, by grace you're saved through faith, it is a free gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So the issue, I think, is that we have to understand that these two things are counterbalancing one another. Primarily, we have to understand that James and Paul were addressing different problems. James in the book of James, Paul in Galatians and elsewhere. Um, Paul's concern were legalists. The book of Galatians is written to counter Jewish Christians who were going to the churches of Asia Minor, Galatian, um, the Galatian churches, and saying to them, you have to be circumcised, you have to be obedient to the, to the law of Moses. You can't eat shellfish, you can't eat bacon, you can't use a bowl that doesn't have a lip, etc., etc., et all the rest of that. They were saying you have to obey all of the law and believe in Jesus if you're going to be a Christian. And Paul, in writing Galatians especially, but other places too, says that's not true. You legalists, you Judaizers, or the, the, the church history name for them is Ebionites, you're wrong. You don't have to do all of those things. You do not have to obey the law to be saved. On the other hand, James is addressing a completely different problem. James is writing about people who were saying, as I said earlier, I can have three-day orgies twice a week, but because I believe in Jesus, that doesn't matter. What I do morally, whether I do good things or do bad things, is completely irrelevant because I have faith in Jesus. And James is saying, no, that's not true. You, if, it's, if you have a real faith, then it has to be reflected in how you live your life. So Paul was addressing the problem of the legalists. James is addressing the problem of the libertines. And again, the, the emphasis, as we have up here, by Paul is that justification before God is by faith. James is saying vindication before men is by works. It is what men see you doing. Um, if you want to have a real faith, especially if you want that faith to affect other people so that they see it and want to be attracted to it, how you act makes a difference. The perspective is Paul was saying that saving faith is a gift. James is saying a mature faith will be demonstrated in action. It's not that works save you. It's that if you're saved, you will do good works. The old thing about don't be good so that God can save you. Let God save you so that you can then be good. And James is saying, if you're not doing any good deeds, then maybe you're not saved. Maybe you're not serious about this. Um, an analogy that I have used for years in teaching the book of James, because I've taught it a number of times, all life has movement, has motion. It's one of the characteristics of any living thing. It has to have some movement. Now, it may move slow, you know, um, the redwood trees. You don't see them move very fast. But if you leave and come back 100 years from now, it's going to be 8 feet taller, okay? It's because it does, there is movement. Um, if there is no movement, something cannot be alive. The complete absence of motion is a sign that there is no life. And as I always said, if you had a horse, and he's been laying on his side out in the field for two weeks and he hasn't moved, then put dirt over him because he's dead. That's what James is saying. If your Christian faith has no evidence of any movement as demonstrated by how you live your life, good works, 
good deeds. If there's no evidence of any movement, then your faith is dead. That's what he's saying. He's not saying that you have to have good works to be saved. He's saying if you have no good works, then you probably aren't saved. And you better look at this. You see the difference? Um, so Paul is saying that um, salvation is received as an eternal position by believing in Christ. James is saying that salvation is demonstrated in daily proof by behaving like Christ. Paul is concerned about what gets you to salvation. James is concerned about what it looks like after you get saved. It's not, they are not contradictory to one another. They're complementary to one another. All right? Um, Christian works don't save a person, but Christian works are the true test of whether or not someone truly is Christian. So Luther had it wrong. I think he figured it out later in his life. But I understand where he was coming from because he was being threatened with death over this whole issue. And so for him, it was very, very important. And so for him, he had difficulty seeing James as a compliment to Paul. And that's why he did not like the book of James. Okay? Um, and here's another quote. Later on, Luther cites James as authoritative teaching from God and describes it as, quote, a good book because it sets up no doctrines of men, but vigorously promulgates the law of God. So it is very much an orientation toward um, the book of James being God's desire for us, not an issue of salvation, but as to how we live our Christian life. Is that clear? Any questions about that? So next time somebody tells you that James and Paul are in disagreement with one another, you're going to know what to say, right? Okay. Because I know you get those questions. Okay. Any questions about any of that so far? All right, I want to give you a few key verses, and then we're going to look at the outline. Um, first, from James 1.19. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Remember, James has 54 different specific commands. And here we get into some of that. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. And you can almost hear the Proverbs in this, right? This sounds like the way Proverbs is. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Here's a passage I referred to earlier. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror, and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. I love the fact that in the book of James, he gives you these little analogies sometimes metaphors, etc., um, that are very practical. You know, this is what that's like. And then it gives you an illustration that helps make you, makes it sink in. Um, here, hearing the word of God, not doing it. He elsewhere talks about loving worldly possessions more than giving, um, not restraining your tongue, not trusting in God's providence, favoring the rich over the poor, etc. But a major theme here is don't just listen to this and then act like there's no difference in your life. If, if you mean it, if you hear God's word, do God's word. S just sit in for an hour a week and listen to somebody preach at you and then go out and acting like you never even heard anything, that's not Christianity. That's not true faith. That's a falsified faith. Perhaps a social, socially acceptable kind of faith. Okay? From James 2, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save him? And here again, he gives you an analogy to, to give you a sense of what this means. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, and does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. I think we can all get that. Right? Just mouthing a platitude towards somebody who has a very practical need does not cut it. That's what James is saying. You have to do something about this stuff, not just talk about it. But suppose someone will, but someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You notice that faith is still at the core of it. It is faith that you're demonstrating, but you're demonstrating it by what you do. You believe there is one God, Good, even the demons believe that and shudder. 
How many times have you heard somebody say, well, I believe in God. I believe in the God of trees and the forests and the lakes. Oh, so you're a pantheist. You don't even know what that means, do you? I've been, I'm talking to somebody here. Um, or people say, well, yeah, I believe in God. You know, I think he's all loving and all good. And, you know, it's... You say you believe in God? Good. The demons believe in God and they shudder. What you believe about God makes a big difference. Not just that you believe in God. You've all heard people say, well, you know, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. I'm sure I've told you this before. When somebody said they're spiritual, but not religious, that means they want all the benefits and none of the responsibilities. Because religious means you are practicing what you believe in some sort of practical ways. Spiritual, I'm spiritual but not religious means I want to get all the good vibes, I want to get all the you know all the blessings and all the good stuff, but I don't want to have to do anything. That sounds a little harsh. Well, sometimes we need to be a little harsh. Okay. Uh, and I've known I've known two people down here who said that and then died, and I fear for them. Okay, because I don't think being spiritual but not religious was going to cut it when they get to the other side. My own sense. Okay, I'll stop preaching now. Um, but you see where, where James is going with this stuff. Any questions about that? Mark? A little, maybe off, but you know, the law will take you so far and you try to obey the law, like the Jews guy that I have it, just doing the minimum. <laughs> Whereas Jesus says, love your neighbor and bless those that persecute you. With. It goes so much farther beyond. Right. And, and once we're, uh, we have the faith and we move into that realm, there's no stopping us. You know? right. We can do a little, we can do a lot, or we don't have to go to bed every night wondering if we don't wake up in the morning, where we'll be. You know, it's kind of a yeah. nice situation. And again, the mature faith, I don't go to bed at night saying, did I do enough good works today? Right. That's never the right question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because my salvation is based upon my faith in Jesus Christ, yeah. purely. And yet, I have a responsibility. You know, it doesn't stop there. It's not It's not all about me. It's not all, well, I'm saved, so the rest of the world forget you. I have a responsibility. I have work to do. I have, I have a, an obligation to then do good works, to show the grace of God in my life. Um, and if I'm not doing that, then, I, you know, then how selfish is that? What's the point of all this? Yes? Um, before Jesus came, the Jews... Uh you mentioned before that perhaps it was coming, they, they were come, would come together as a state or a nation, and that was the form of salvation. Did I get that right? Um, well, right. salvation to the Jews meant return from exile. Okay. That's what that was how they defined salvation is return to the promised land from exile. So was this a big jump for them from what their belief was to how James uh, and Paul were talking about? how to continue your life as being saved, and was that a huge step for them? Um, well, it was, but it wasn't so much James and Paul. To take a step back from that. Um, the Jewish expectation, again, salvation to the to the Jews before the time of Jesus would have been, meant return from exile, return to the, promise, to the land that's been promised to us from exile. And there is a clear doctrine in the Jewish faith of an eternal kingdom, you know, that people... Their souls would live forever. They would, and the expectation was that they would live under the authority and love of a Messiah. That that Messiah, the Jews before Jesus believed, would be like King David, a just and righteous king who would make them great, and they would be first amongst all the earth as God's chosen people. I mean, that's how they perceived eternal life. Now, the difference was when Jesus came along, and this is one of the things that the Jews back then and even today have trouble with, understanding, or accepting at least, is that the Messiah wasn't just an, an earthly king like David. They thought that, you know, he was going to be like King David and he would come and drive out the oppressors, meaning the Romans in Jesus' time, and would establish Israel above, among all the kingdoms of the world as being on top, foremost. And as Jews, they were going to be the chosen people of God and they would be better off than anybody. It was news to them that the Messiah, and it shouldn't necessarily have been, because there's a lot of references to this in the Old Testament, of there being a, a divine aspect to the Messiah. Daniel 7, there's several Psalms, etc. Isaiah. Um, 
the idea that the Messiah wasn't an earthly king like they expected. He wasn't a military ruler. He wasn't going to sit on the throne as David sat on the throne. But rather that he was divine. He was the very son of God. And that his kingdom was not just the, the geopolitical nation of Israel. But rather his kingdom would be for all people everywhere for all time. And that when he ultimately returned, he would be the king over all creation. That was not how they understood it. Now... The reason why a lot of Jews did become Christians then, and Jews still become Christians today, is because when you look back at the Old Testament, realizing what we know about Jesus now, it all makes sense in a much more complex, a much more appropriate and interesting and, and satisfying way than just thinking he's going to be a king like David was a king. Um, you, a lot of the Old Testament prophecies they didn't get about the Messiah are completely understandable in the light of Jesus. And so Jews who became Christians, they, they saw that and they agreed with it. Um, for instance, the idea that, well, it's going to be all about us Jews and about the nation of Israel and our promised land, and, you know, that's what this is all about, completely overlooks the fact that the promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Moses, was that I will bless you, you I will be your God, you will be my people, and through you I will bless all the other peoples of the earth. Jesus as the divine Messiah over all of creation explains that. And that makes sense because the Jewish concept of them as a reunited, you know, a nation of Israel over all the rest of the world, you know, like it's, you know, we're, we're five runs above all the rest of you all people. Um, none of that really fits with the messianic prophecies that were given through the Old Testament. Jesus does. And so, yes, it was a big leap, but it wasn't because they had problems with Paul and problems with James so much. It was the very concept of what the Messiah was supposed to be was difficult for the Jews to get. Those who did, who were open-minded, who were honest about it and really looked at Jesus and looked at what the Old Testament said, they would go, wow, you're, yeah, this makes good sense. And that still is true today. You know, Jews that accept Jesus today, it's primarily because they look at their own prophetic history in the, in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, and then look at the historical Jesus and say, this fits. This makes sense. I think this guy is the Messiah. There's a story I just wrote in an article or a letter for Jews for Jesus, a guy named Ariel, who 20-some years ago was in New York City. And he saw a guy wearing a t-shirt that said, Jews for Jesus. And he got mad. And he said to his friends who he was sitting with, somebody should go over there and tell that guy that you can't be a Jew and believe in Jesus. And they said, well, go for it, Ariel. So he got up and went over there and told the guy. And the guy, rather than being defensive, was very calm and, you know, very... And he handed him a brochure that said, Jews should not believe in Jesus unless... And it goes through, it's, a, it's like a brochure panel uh, with drawings. They do these things called broadsides. And it takes like half a dozen different major prophetic statements in the Old Testament about who the Messiah is going to be. And then it says, it, it explains how that's exactly what Jesus did, or that's exactly what Jesus said, or that's exactly, you know, how Jesus presented it. And it goes through this whole thing, and at the end, the point is, Jews should not believe in Jesus unless there is evidence that Jesus fulfills the Jewish expectation to be the Messiah. Well, Ariel became a Christian. He took that home. He spent weeks and weeks and weeks thinking about it. Finally, ended up calling them and talking to somebody. He's now the leader for Jews for Jesus ministry in Eastern Europe. He's been responsible for planting, you know, planting ministries all over Eastern Europe. His first reaction was, a Jew can't believe in Jesus. Well, if you go through and you seriously look at that, then Jesus does fulfill the Old Testament, not New Testament, the Old Testament prophecies about the expectations for the Messiah. And Jews who were willing to hear that, who don't just shut everything out, they were converted in the first century and they're still converted today. It's a long answer to your question. But. That's good. Okay. Um, all right. Let's spend a few minutes here, and we are going to get done early, I promise, um, looking at the outline. It starts out with greetings. You know, and it just, again, James just identifies himself as James, and it's very clear he knew everybody's going to know who this is. That's why it has to either be James the son of Zebedee, James the Greater, or James the Just, the brother, half-brother of Jesus. James the son of Zebedee was almost certainly dead by then. And so we believe it is James, the brother, half-brother of Jesus. Uh, and he says, to the twelve tribes scattered, which means the Jewish Christians. And the expectation is that that's a reference 
to the diaspora or the spreading out that happened after the stoning of Stephen. Remember the persecution that started with the stoning of Stephen. Um, from there, the Jews, Jewish Christians, especially the Hellenized Jewish Christians, more so even than the, the Hebraic Jewish Christians, took off from there and left Jerusalem. And they, they went to Damascus. You remember Paul was on his way to Damascus with, with uh, orders to uh, papers that allowed him to arrest Jews who were claiming Jesus as the Messiah. Um, but they'd gone everywhere, Asia Minor, Alexandria, you know, various other places. And so the 12 tribes um, scattered among the nations, is what the reference is, indicates that it is after that diaspora, the scattering out, the spreading out, that happened after the stoning of Stephen, that first Jewish persecution of Jewish Christians. And again, people look at that and say, well, how is it that Peter and James and John and all these other people stayed in Jerusalem. Well, the indication is that Stephen and other um, Hellenized, that is Greek-influenced Jews, and all of the deacons of the early church, for instance, all had Greek names. They were elected particularly to address the fact that Hebrew, the Hebrew widows and orphans were getting more food distributions than the Greek Hebrews, uh, the Greek widows and orphans. Because the Jews at that time tended to be either more Hebraic, which the Pharisees represented the Hebraic side, or more Hellenized, more Greek. The Sadducees represented that side. And so there may have, there appears to have been a split in the persecution there. But either way, they had scattered. And one of the things in God's miraculous plan and timing is because of the fact that these were Jewish Christians and the persecution started in Jerusalem, caused them to scatter out, what was the side effect of that? The, the gospel spread. The gospel was taken to many different places. That happened at Pentecost when people went back home after hearing the gospel message. It also happened in the persecution after Stephen's stoning where people went back. That's why you get cases like from, from one of those two, uh, you know, either people returning after Pentecost having gotten saved or spreading out after the persecution. You get people like um, Apollo coming from Alexandria, already a Christian, even though he didn't have very good theology and, and Priscilla and Aquila had to teach him, he, he was a believer. Somebody had carried the message to Alexandria and he was saved. You get Priscilla and Aquila coming from Rome very early, already Christians, because somebody, either from Pentecost or from this persecution, had gone to Rome as a Jew, spread the gospel message, and they got saved. So we see that that, that benefits. So it is to the 12 tribes scattered amongst the nations. James then goes into a listing of trials and temptations. He starts out, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And so, remember, the um, within the context of faith without works is dead, major themes over, overlaying all of that is patience, perseverance, and a willingness to be faithful even in light of both trials and temptations. Hang in there during your trials and temptations. Okay? He talks about the testing of the faith first, and then the source of temptation, starting with the 13th verse. And he makes it very clear that God does not tempt us. It is not God tempting us. He says in verse 13, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. As I've said to you before, God does not tempt, but God does test. The difference is, when God tests us, He wants us to succeed. He wants us to be stronger. He wants us to be better. He wants us to come out on the right side. Temptation, like the devil does, is very different. He tempts us because He wants us to fail. So a temptation is given by the devil to cause us to fail, if he can. A test is given to us by God in order to make us stronger and make us better. You know, when I give you guys tests at the end of our terms, it's not because I want you to fail, it's because I want you to learn this stuff. I want you to do better. I want you to know this. God tests in the same way, but he never tempts. All right? So we can never make that mistake. Questions about that? I'm going to go ahead, we'll go about another 10 or 15 minutes and then we'll be done. So I'm not going to take a break right now. Is that okay? If anybody does need to, to take a break, they can. Um, he then gets into the, the issue of listening and doing. He says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Remember, those commands that he's giving us. Doom, doom, doom. Um, 
Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires, therefore get rid of all moral filth, the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Don't respond to oppression, or temptation, or anything else with anger and with violence, but rather with patience, seeking righteousness, not revenge. Okay? And part of that is be willing to listen before you talk. Be willing to, to live out your, your calling. He then talks about favoritism being forbidden, uh, particularly that if, he says if someone comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and another man comes in wearing poor clothes um, that are filthy, then don't give all your positive attention to the rich guy and make the poor guy sit in the corner. That there should be a recognition that we don't discriminate based upon those kinds of uh, differences um, because that's what an evil judge does and one of the things he addresses in here as well is oppression that you are oppressed by you know the by the rich and so why would you favor them they're the ones giving you trouble the poor aren't giving you any problems mm -hmm. um, then he talks about faith and deeds which is the most critical part in the middle of the second chapter the part that we mostly know um, again what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such a faith save them? Faith without works is dead, is what he gets to in that. That we have to not only have faith, first, faith is, you know, is, is belief in Jesus Christ, but then that, if it's real, has to be reflected in some sort of movement in a Christian life. Deeds. He then has a, a fascinating section about the taming of the tongue. He talks about the fact that the tongue's like, like, a spark that starts a, for a fire, a huge fire. But it's a tiny thing, but it can create huge destruction. Um, he says, like the bit, you know, the bit in the mouth of a horse that can direct it uh, anywhere. If, if you control the mouth, you can direct it anywhere you want. Like the, the rudder of a ship, it's a small thing, but if you can control the rudder, you can take it anywhere you want. But if you don't control that small thing, everything's going to go bad. Well, the tongue is just like that, he says. And he talks about, you know, you don't slander, you don't malign people, you don't speak ill. Then he goes on to talk about two different kinds of wisdom. Um, wisdom, the, there is deeds done in humility, um, not harboring bitter envy and selfish ambition. And uh, that's the good kind of wisdom. And then there's a false wisdom, which comes from down... Uh, from down below. It's earthly, unspiritual, demonic, um, where you have envy, selfish ambition, disorder, every evil practice. You know, the world thinks we're crazy for believing this stuff. They think they're smarter than us. Well, the worldly wisdom is exactly, that kind of worldly wisdom is exactly what James is talking about. It sounds good, and they convince us that that's good. Oh, you know, what do you mean that you're, you know, you're faithful to your spouse and you don't sleep with anybody else? That's crazy. No, it's not. You're crazy. The difference in godly wisdom and worldly wisdom. That we're to have the godly wisdom and recognize and reject the worldly wisdom that tells us to do things we know we should not do. Yes? Yeah, well, when you're in business and you're working with other people who feel free to lie and cheat and steal, oh, yeah. and you feel like you're at a disadvantage because uh, they, they can do all kinds of things that you don't feel is, is acceptable. And you may be at a disadvantage for a little while, <laughs> but it pays off in the end. The whole game is it's a different game than what we're, what it we're is. playing. We're not, we're not in that for the most money and the most prestige and the most of, uh, traveling on the most people. It's about a whole, different, a whole different kingdom. Yeah, we have a complete different set of rules. We have a completely different set of values. We have a completely different set of criteria. That's the difference in earthly wisdom and the worldly wisdom. And he goes on at the end of chapter <clears> 3 and says, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. The world does not understand that way of thinking. That is the godly wisdom, heavenly wisdom. Um, he then goes on to talk about warnings against other kinds of worldliness. Um, he says that don't allow yourself to get into fights and quarrels, um, and, and there's some extraordinary things in here. He says, when you ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives. And you spend what you get on your own passions. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Um, he, 
again, he deals with this whole issue that what the world thinks it expects is not the same as what God expects. Completely different set of values, completely different set of expectations. Again, he talks about quarrelsomeness. He talks about spiritual unfaithfulness of not, of, that's why he calls us, uh, you adulterous people, speaking to those who spiritually are not faithful to God. Um, he talks about pride. Um, do you not think script? Do you think Scripture says without reason that He jealously longs for the Spirit because He has He has made to dwell in you, but He gives us more grace? That's why the Scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Again, the world does not understand that. That the humble, you know, blessed are the meek. The world doesn't get that. He talks about slander, back to that using your tongue. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister uh, or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it. Now, here when he talks about the law, he means the law of love, which he talks about, and Paul also uses that expression, meaning it is not the Mosaic law, but the thing that should instead direct us and command us, which is the love God has shown for us in our response to that. No boasting. And then he talks about warning to rich oppressors. Remember I said that earlier, that he talks about the fact that you guys always want to suck up to the rich, and yet the rich are the ones that are oppressing you. And he says, those of you who are poor, be grateful for your high position. And those of you who are rich, recognize that you are only here for a little while. Okay, so he completely does a reverse in terms of our, our understanding and expectation of wealth and of poverty. That wealth is a fleeting thing that people depend on and they will pay the consequences for that. Poverty is actually a position of grace, according to James. And then you will be blessed in that. He then goes in toward the end of chapter seven, uh, 5 into mis uh, miscellaneous exhortations. Talks about, again, as he starts out uh, the whole book with concerning patience and suffering, concerning not swearing oaths, you know, let your yay be yay, anything more than that, uh, get you in trouble concerning the prayer of faith, and then concerning those who wander from the truth. Uh, he ends by saying, My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. That we can bring those who have fallen back. Um, and we're called to do so. Any questions about any of that? Yes? Quick question. I'm all confused about dates and times of history, which is nothing for me. But anyways, have the persecutions by Nero taken place yet? No. Persecutions by Nero's were the end of the 50s and early 60s. So the only persecution that would have happened by this time was the early Jewish persecution, but not the Roman persecutions. Okay. Other questions? Well, I hope you will forgive me for letting you off early today, but as I say, as I've worked on these books, I recognize that once we've dealt with what we need to deal with, it doesn't make sense to try to come up with something just to keep us sitting here for two hours. Judy? So that means that he, he's talking a lot about you can't live in two worlds. Like you, you can't live in the world. At least you can't live by the standards of two worlds. You know, James is not advocating. Um, and, and in fact, nowhere. Paul is very clear about this. They're not advocating that we take ourselves out of the world. Even places where, um, when he says true, true religion is this, you know, to care for widows and orphans, James says, and to not allow yourself to be polluted by the world. That has often been interpreted as saying that we need to remove ourselves from the world. We need to have a compound and, you know, guard gates and nobody allowed in. We need to have our own little Christian fraccionamiento and nobody gets in. No, that's not what they're talking about. Because... Is it not quite the contrary? Uh, the same, you know, the same writings say you are the salt of the, of the earth. You are the light set on a hill. You know, we can't be salt and light, I've said it many times, if we never let non-believers get close enough to us to taste us and see us. And so that's not what they're talking about. What they're talking about is being uh, in, you know, in the world, but not out of the world. Meaning we have an obligation to interact with and be part of and be community with people who are not believers, because that's the only way we're ever going to influence them to the positive, and we're called to do exactly that. And go into all the world, teaching them, and baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we can't do that if we isolate ourselves. But the danger, and it is a danger, and that's why 
James and Paul and others talk about it a lot, is that when we are in the world, there's a danger of us getting polluted, of falling, you know, of listening to the world's wisdom, of taking their moral standards, of saying, okay, well, this is only a little white lie, you know. Um, the challenge, and it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can pull this off, is to be in the world and yet maintain the Christian stance as we are taught it in the Word. That's why we need to be in the Word so we remember what that is. We don't get confused about it. But, um, yeah, that's the challenge. The idea of being an isolated Christian community, that doesn't mean that every, every Christians who have ever, ever decided to live together, you know, were wrong. Sometimes that becomes a platform and a foundation, you know, a base from which they can do more effective outreach, you know, bring people back, care for them, etc. So I'm not saying that it's always a bad idea for Christians to live in community, but to live in an isolated community is not biblical. Well, the other, okay. the other problem with isolated community is oftentimes you forget who the enemy is and you begin to attack each other yeah. rather than... There's also, I mean, when we get insular like that, there's also a danger that our doctrine goes screwy. I mean, so many of the Christian communities have started out, you know, okay, and but because they, they cut themselves off from outside influence and from tempering, then they end up going the wrong direction. A good example, you all know Oneida Silver, right? Well, Oneida Silver was first produced by the Oneida community in New York, which was a Christian community. And when they first started, they were a legitimate Christian community. Within a few years, they had group marriages and all kinds of weird stuff. Well, one of the things they did to make money for the, to, to support the community was they did silver work. And that's where Oneida Silver came from. But the Oneida community in New York State started out legitimate Christian and then went very cultic. And there's always that danger because they were very much isolationist. You know, they, they cut themselves off thinking that they were protecting themselves from the pollution of the world. And the devil got in their midst and tore them to pieces. Sometimes we need the influence of outside, if only to say, well, we can't do that because that will make us like them. And if you don't know what them is like anymore, then you know you can lose your perspective. Okay? Okay. Yeah, I read an article about the Shakers, and of course they uh, had a very powerful movement at one point. Mm -hmm. But their leader declared that Adam's original sin was having sex with Eve, and so men and women became lived separate and fit, and so that kind of failed to reproduce at yep. that point. And they, even though they did a lot of good things, their movement is pretty much gone yeah. now because you don't generally get too many male converts. Yeah, well, one, for many, many, many years, I know something about the Shakers because there's a Shaker village in Kentucky, not right. far from where mm -hmm. I lived, uh, and also New York and that sort of thing. So they, they maintain celibacy, yeah. but for many, many years, they continued to grow, sustain themselves and even grow by adopting. Right. Because they were so well thought of by everybody else, they were so industrious, they had very successful farms, they, they, their handicraft work, I mean their craft work, they made all their own furniture, Shaker furniture. Um, it was so spectacular, and you go to the Shaker villages now, and they're just gorgeous and beautifully designed and everything else, but it's kind of weird. The big dormitory houses, this big, big house, two doors, right next to each other, like a meter apart. Well. You go on the inside, and there's no wall separating that. But well, women went in one door, and men went in the other. There was a staircase for men. There was a staircase for women. Their rooms were on the opposite side of the building. And they maintained this separation of men and women. They did not believe in, in <coughs> sexual intercourse. Um, and yeah, after many years of maintaining themselves by adopting children, because again, they were so well thought of, and this was in a period of time in the 1800s when there were a lot of poor people and couldn't, couldn't support their children, the Shakers could take care of them. So they would adopt them. Um, but they had some wacky ideas, um, some very good ideas, mm -hmm. and certainly skill. But yeah, they got it wrong. So anyway, thank you all very much.